On March 4, 1979, a young and newly elected Pope John Paul II promulgated his first encyclical, beginning with these words. The Redeemer of man, Jesus Christ, is the center of the universe and of history. And yet now, 38 years later, in the face of these words, we look around. We look at the world that surrounds us and wonder if they are just a hollow theological echo passing through the halls of time. We can ask if the life of humanity really revolves around the person of Jesus Christ. We can wonder if the universe itself truly points to the presence of the Word made flesh. We can scan the pages of human history, questioning whether Jesus is the primary protagonist that moves us from one generation to the next. More than ever today, on this solemnity of Jesus Christ, the King of the universe, we can ask, is it true? Is it true that the Redeemer of man, Jesus Christ, is the center of our existence and of the entire universe? One of the greatest challenges, it seems to me, to recognizing the kingship of Christ and his central position in our lives is that he is not a king in the way that we would expect or perhaps even prefer. Jesus doesn't impose his will. He doesn't force our subjugation. He doesn't smash with his fist from on high. Instead, as St. John Paul II says, he became an actor in human history, one of the thousands of millions of human beings, but at the same time, unique. And his nearness to us is precisely what makes it difficult to see him as king. You know, if he were distant or demanding or imposing, we might feel his presence a little more. We might not like it, but we might feel it a little more. But he doesn't come in that way. That's not the method he's chosen to come to us. He comes as one of us, as one of the rabble, as a face among all the other faces in human history that we pass every single day. And so while we say, show us your power, he says, let go of your power and find me in your weakness. While we say, show us something extraordinary, something that will blow our minds, he says, look for me in the ordinary circumstances of everyday life. While we say, show us your glory, he says, humble yourself, and you will find me there kneeling beside you. Because he has chosen not to rule this world from a distant throne, but from among us. And we hear this in the prophet Ezekiel this morning, I myself, we hear that phrase repeated in that reading, I myself will shepherd my sheep, the lost I will seek out, the strayed I will bring back, the injured I will bind up, the sick I will heal. This is a king who is willing to get his hands dirty on those entrusted to his care. He's willing to suffer with those who are suffering. And so the test of our belonging to this king is not some kind of blind submission, just kind of doing whatever he says in a robotic way. Instead, the test of our following this king is intentional imitation. If we belong to the king, then we will serve like the king. It means that in this world, we're not seeking lofty thrones or great fame or unfailing power. 
Instead, we're seeking his face among those who are rejected just as he was rejected. We are seeking his mercy among the imprisoned and those who are in most need of his mercy. We are seeking his abiding presence among those who are hungry and naked and alone. Friends, he has not chosen some place that is exclusive, that is available only to some. He's not chosen a place that is reserved only for those with the most intelligence or with the most strength. No. Christ has chosen to come to us in a way that is accessible to all. Friends, he is not distant from us. And I think in many ways, this is one of the most challenging things for us to receive. That God, the almighty king of the universe, comes to us in a lowly way, in a humble way. It's almost too much for our minds to grasp. And so it's not his distance that makes this uncomfortable. It's his nearness, his closeness to us. He is so close to his creation that we have trouble seeing him. It's his association with the lowly that makes us a little squeamish. Because it means that to be near him, that we have to become lowly ourselves. That we have to associate with those who are lowly. And this is, you and I know, this is contrary to what happens in this world. In this world, so often people draw near to those with power in order to avoid the feeling of being lowly. In this world, people stay close to, to those who are in charge so that they can somehow feel dominion over others. In this world, we stay close to those in authority so that we can feel protected and even perhaps we can be rewarded for our fidelity to them. But this is not the dynamic of the kingship of Christ. It is against the, the, the mindset of power in this world. Jesus doesn't want us to show off in front of him to curry his favor. He's not asking us to bring some treasure of great material possessions or accomplishments that we could place before him. Jesus wants to be near us. He wants to be close to us. He is not a king that rules from a distance. Jesus wants to embrace us, to hold us to himself. It's why he has taken on our humanity, so that he can share in the suffering that we experience, so that he can share in the joy that we celebrate in this life. This is why these words that we hear in our gospel, whatever you did to one of these least ones, you did to me. This is not just an accusation. It is an invitation for those who say, I don't know where God is. I can't feel his presence. I don't think that God is near me. I don't think that God is present in this world. I don't know where to find him. Jesus says to us, whatever you did for one of these least ones, you did for me. Can we see that God is not distant? He's not out there somewhere. He's not an abstract thought. He's not a philosophical concept. Whatever you did for one of these least ones, you did for me. If we don't know where God is, if we don't know how to serve him, then go to a soup kitchen. Go to Green River Road in the Lloyd. Look at those who are holding signs, asking for assistance. And it doesn't mean that you shell out every, every penny that you have on you. But look in the eyes of those who are begging. Listen to them. Suffer with them. Have compassion for them. Whatever you did, 
for one of these least ones. You did for me. It seems to me that it is not the glory of the king that we struggle with. In fact, we long for that glory. It's his lowliness that is disturbing. It's his lowliness that shakes us to the core. And so are we, are we humble enough to serve such a humble king? Or are we too proud to embrace the infinite God who bent down over our poor humanity and became one like us? It's not a theological question. It's a human question. And it's a question of salvation.